The subject of this morning's roundtable is special education policies for students with disabilities. You know, we know that uh, many of our students, special education students and teachers face challenges in the best of times. And um, we've been weathering some of the worst of times, as I said, for nearly two years. We're seeing a cliff where children were supported through IEPs and other supports through their 18th birthday and then came out into the world and lost those supports and had a harder time living independently. Aussie's 2019 landscape on special education revealed many disturbing trends in the district, including that 0% of students aged 14 to 21 exited special education to general education in 2018, ranking DC last in the nation. Aussie must modernize how it works with early intervention families, specifically how parents and guardians receive information and shared evidence of their children's progress with their related service providers so that parents and families can receive updates and feedback on their child's progress in real time with the outcome of ensuring their students exit from services. Additionally, virtual learning alone was not sufficient for all students with special needs. It did not have as great of a positive impact as in-person learning, which creates an additional imperative to ensure special education services are closing outcome gaps for all children. Extend Individual with Disability Education Act protections to ensure more inclusive educational opportunities. A, to give to government funded out of school programming to include training of transportation providers, after school staff, and all staff. Also to ensure a 504 plan accountability is as robust as IEP. And to require career technical education programming is accessible to students with disabilities. School staffing shortages are preventing students with disabilities from receiving the services to which they are entitled under federal law. For example, both instructors in the Deaf and Hard of Hearing program at Payne Elementary School have quit this year, and the school has not provided opportunities to make up services missed when the classroom was without a qualified instructor. We have had similar cases in both DCPS and in charter schools. We urge the council, along with the education agencies, the charter sector, WTU, and other community stakeholders to develop a comprehensive strategy for addressing these staffing shortages and to ensure that students with disabilities have the support and services to which they are entitled. Second, regarding informal discipline, our attorneys report a recent increase in incidents where students with disabilities are being sent home early from school or asked to stay home in response to behavior or discipline incidents. These in these cases, parents are not being told that their student has been suspended. So he was at DCPS from pre-K three to second grade. We loved his school. They just never flagged his, his dyslexia. And in second grade, he couldn't read or write a thing. And I had to say, you know, hey there, and, and wave the red flags. And someone said, summer reading loss. He couldn't read a thing. Finally, I kind of pushed for the IEP. And the experience I have, I, I don't think is unique. We're not Watkins which is a really great community. He loves it there. I like it there. 400 kids, not a single teacher is trained in Orton Gillingham, you know, one of the best known methods. They have one reading specialist who um, everyone loves if you can get her, but she doesn't have time. Um, as we have throughout the pandemic, AJ, AJE is hearing from families that not only are they experiencing significant delays in having their evaluations for their children completed. And this is both initial evaluations and re-evaluations. Um, not only are they seeing delays, sometimes they're seeing an outright refusal to evaluate a student for a disability. Other thing that we're hearing from families, which is that schools are really struggling with staff, um, which means again, that students are going without services, evaluations. One of the most consistent problems LEA space is having adequate special education staff. This is a ninth grader who at the beginning of the school year tested at the pre-K reading level. Pre-K at ninth grade. After receiving an evidence-based reading intervention for the past more, four months, he's, re, he's grown two grade levels. More would have testified if the hearing was held after school hours especially the students and teachers. Um, I also heard that um, schools are blocking parents from even putting in the paperwork for special ed because they said that they don't have the money to evaluate. What? What? When someone needs to check in on that. You know, and, and I want to be really honest here. I do think to some extent it's because there's an increased need now. Um, you know, the pandemic has had an adverse effect on kids. 
And there well, are kids who may not have presented as disabled before who are presenting that way now. Do we need to rethink how we're doing this in terms of if you have a school staff who is stretched then, who else can step in to get the evaluation done? And why are we not thinking about it in that way? They are so stressed about this. They want to do the evaluations, but there is no one out there to do it. There's a backlog. So even those that have staff and they've pulled their staff to do evaluations at the de to the detriment of students who have therapeutic services that they need. It's like there's a no-win situation. Uh, where are the gaps in capacity? Like at what, what positions are we seeing the most capacity issues? Psychologists, um, it's a huge, huge staffing issue. And I'll be transparent and say, in a city with as many LEAs as you have, in a region with as many LEAs as you have, it is very easy for people to move from LEA to LEA. And so, you know, someone shifting to a new place creates a vacancy somewhere else. Okay. And I heard, I heard bus drivers, I heard psychologists. Are there any other positions that we are speaking of when we speak of the staffing shortage? Special education teachers, and um, we're also seeing speech language therapists. Ah. Occupational therapists were a huge shortage before the pandemic, and that has only gotten worse. While my son made it out of the NICU relatively unscathed, my daughter had a severe brain bleed, which has resulted in a life of medical struggles and developmental delays. Having a special needs child is a struggle for any family, no matter their financial resources or their emotional bandwidth. It is heartbreaking to watch your child suffer and miss milestones. This committee cannot change that for us. What you can do, however, is make sure that all of our children are educated. As, um, at present, children with complicated medical educational needs are being systematically discriminated against within the DCPS system. This past May, my daughter's school released her, and by law, DCPS had to lead, take the lead in finding a new placement. They sent her IAP to a variety of schools, most of which were wildly inappropriate. All rejected her out of hand because of her cortical visual impairment, which is a diagnosis that is the leading cause of visual impairment in children in the United States. While my son, he is eligible to receive transportation, we, um, I actually opted out to take him personally. To date, no one from Aussie reached out to me to provide me with any guidance or information about how I could even get reimbursed. It says teachers often leave pre-service without clarity on cognitive science. The article gives examples of teachers who went through years of study at universities to become special education teachers and reading specialists and felt unprepared to teach reading because they weren't exposed to systematic phonics programs. Most did not understand the evidence-based strategies for teaching early reading unless they paid for further training beyond their university education. Another big problem is the categorization of specific disorders. He aged out of learning disability class of the learning disability classification and became autism because there is no classification for sensory processing disorder. Yet another problem, there should be a classification for sensory processing disorder. Work with DOH to streamline the certification process for related services and reinstate the reciprocity exemption. We ask the council to work to streamline the credentialing process for related service providers. The current wait time for new applicants has slowed our hiring process during a staff shortage. In addition, we ask that the council reinstate reciprocity in the exemption granted during the pandemic so that our providers can deliver services to our students in quarantine outside of the district. I have witnessed this cycle repeatedly over the 20 years since my child entered the DC special education system. It is actually worse now and has resulted in a very lopsided special education system with many DCPS schools serving more than their proportional share of neurodiverse students. When the charter school law was passed, I thought OSSI, the PS, PCSB, and charter schools would get together to form a special education consortium to combine forces and utilize economies of scale in order to be able to appropriately educate students with disability disabilities. That never happened. So now we have a bifurcated education system splitting special education and 504 services 
over 60 school districts, about 60 school districts, including DCPS, none of whom have the capacity to appropriately and meaningfully serve all students with disabilities that walk through their doors. 